Hi everyone, this is Kristen and this is a follow-up video to um, the other video that I created about questions to ask uh, before and between appointments. This video is going to be specifically about questions to ask during and after appointments. And this is a, a kind of heavier lift kind of topic. Um, you know, I get questions about, you know, how, what do you do when you feel dismissed by a doctor or how do you navigate when to know, like, how do you know when to essentially fire a doctor and move on to another one? How do you know when to get a second opinion? Um, these kind of more difficult questions that we deal with when we're trying to navigate the healthcare system. Um, I'm speaking specifically from my experience um, in the healthcare system in the United States in 2023. This, um, my experience goes back uh, to about, I mean, you know, since you're a kid, usually you, you kind of go to doctor's appointments when you're a kid, but also, um, but more recently with my, my diagnosis journey and everything, it's been since like 2017-ish, 2016, 2017. So more recently. Um, so yeah, I think that this is a really important topic and I think that a lot of it is going to hinge on self-awareness, which we kind of touched on, not explicitly, but it's, it's, I think the key to what we're getting at in that first video about understanding your symptoms and understanding your body before you go into that appointment to the best you can, you know, you can only, you can only understand so much, uh, when you're trying to seek out a diagnosis and, um, there are limitations, but just really being aware of when you're having symptoms and the circumstances surrounding that and how those symptoms might be described. Um, so in this video, these are going to be the more kind of nuanced questions that might come up during an appointment and that might be helpful in helping you navigate from that point in real time. I know that for me, it's really difficult when I'm in an appointment um, to immediately come up with the questions that I have on the spot. Um, for me, it usually takes some processing and um, some time before I'm able to come back to a provider and to ask those questions. And I don't think there's that's necessarily a wrong way of doing it. I just think that um, for me, I've learned that if I can have those questions in mind going into an appointment um, or have them written down, then it makes the it makes the process a little bit lighter and more effective and gets me to where I need to go faster. And so I'm hoping that it'll do the same for you. Um, if you're like me, you have probably not had the greatest experiences with the healthcare system and um, you know, there's a lot of things that are out of control for patients and quite frankly, there's a lot of things that are out of control for even healthcare providers. And, um, we won't get completely into that topic cause that's, that's a whole other video. But, um, I know that for me, like when I was younger, for example, and I think this is maybe just a, a natural part of, of growing up is that when I was a kid, you know, my mom was an RN and so she a lot of times had a knowledge base to speak from and to ask questions and so a lot of times when I was younger I kind of felt talk, talked, spoken to over, talked over, um, spoken for. Um, I didn't really feel like I had my own voice in those appointments and it just, I kind of felt like a victim a lot of the time I think. I think I felt like I was just being passed around, you know, and I, I don't think that was the intent. I think that, you know, parents and providers do the best they can, but as kids, there's only so much that we can communicate. And I, I think it's been a learning curve for me to, um, to find my voice and to, um, get into the research of what I felt like was helpful for me and to really, come up with the questions that were so specific that in the appointments they could help me and the provider really 
get to the crux of issues. And so um, I think, you know, for a lot of us in the chronic illness community um, or those with more rare conditions or conditions that providers might not be aware of. So a lot of people go through this with Ehlers-Danlos and I think it's fantastic that we have so many um, influencers, we have so many people on social media that are um, communicating about Ehlers-Danlos because I think there's much more awareness now out there. Um, but I think when doctors are not aware of certain conditions, you know, they have a limited knowledge bank that they're pulling from and so they might not recognize um, the, specific, the specific symptoms that you have could be connected with a different condition. And so we might go through misdiagnosis. We might go through several doctors not knowing what, um, not knowing what we're experiencing or not understanding. And um, I think it can be really easy to start to feel dismissed, um, to feel not heard. Um, I think, you know, this is something that gets brought up a lot more recently. Um, the whole kind of over psychologizing um, of actual conditions is be it's become something that we're much more aware of in our our cultural awareness um, and so i think healthcare providers are much more sensitive now um, and don't always dismiss actual medical conditions as psychologically based um, and so I think that's a good thing, but I think there's still also a lot that doctors just don't know and a lot that they're not taught in medical school. And, you know, just from a human standpoint, we all have our limited capacities and we all have our areas of expertise. We can't, we can't know it all. And there's just breakdowns in communication. Um, there's silos of communication. So this is the way that I have found best to deal with that. Um, I know for me personally, um, I've had to deal with a lot of questions, like just mental challenges of like, what are the doctors going to think? Like if I'm presenting these symptoms, um, are they going to think I'm crazy? Are they going to think that it's all in my head? Are they going to think I'm making it up or that I'm trying to get some kind of insurance benefits out of it? Um, just a lot of that kind of anxiety going into appointments. And um, the thing that I have learned that uh, by trial and error really, is if I don't ask those questions, um, if, I, if I don't ask these specific questions. So for example, if I have a specific question that I think could be confrontational um, to a doctor, and I'm afraid to ask it because I'm afraid what they're gonna think. I find that after that, I might have like this like temporary, oh, like it's okay, like we didn't get to that question, but eh, it doesn't matter. Um, I might have that initial um, feeling coming out of an appointment, but then sooner or later I start to feel anxious because the issue that I had in mind wasn't addressed and there's still lingering questions that I have. And, um, that's when like I start going in circles with providers and I just start to feel exhausted because I'm trying to like, you know, maybe communicate information that they just, they don't have the knowledge base for, or, um, you know, I think that that just, that back and forth can cause a lot of frustration and exhaustion. Um, and for me, I've like felt that you know i know gaslighting is a, can be a big topic in social media and narcissism and that kind of thing but i think something that doesn't get talked about often is that you know when we fail to ask really important significant questions out of fear of what the other person will think um, when we ask challenging questions or we um, present alternative ideas then if we don't ask those or we don't present those, then we can start to feel gaslit, or at least I have in, in my cases. And um, it's not that the other person is meaning to gaslight. I think it's just that they couldn't, they can't, they can't mind read, right? So like people can't read what's on our minds. And so I think it's easy to feel gaslit or dismissed um, 
if those particular issues aren't brought up. And so I think the great thing about asking these really specific challenging questions is that it cuts to the chase, cuts to the chase. And even if um, they're uncomfortable, it's going to, in the long term, get you where you need to go. And, um, you know, another thing that I've thought about going into appointments is that, um, you know, people talk about feeling on and like being on for an, a provider and um, being able to communicate so that you can get where you need to go. And I completely understand that. Like I, I struggle with that. Um, and I think for me, it's, it's very, a very performance based mindset. And so I'm personally in my life, I'm trying to get rid of, you know, not only in patient provider settings, but just in my life in general, um, I'm trying to get rid of the, the performance mindset of having to be on in any kind of situation. I just want to be present and self-aware. And so, um, you know, that's broken down a lot of the anxiety that I've had going into appointments. And then it's also um, helped me conserve a lot of energy because I felt like, oh, if I have to, you know, muster up this energy that I don't have, like that just even makes me more exhausted, you know? So I think that just listening to my body and then communicating how I'm feeling in appointments has has gone a long way. Um, if I'm having a particularly, like if I'm having a migraine that morning or just brain foggy, then I do my best to communicate that to providers. And um, it can be really helpful for them too, like for them to see in real time, you know, this is how this is affecting that person. And um, even to say, you know, to the provider, I might be seeming to communicate really well to you, but to me, this isn't my normal. And so I can sense the difference, but I know that it might be difficult for you to see because you don't see me in the day to day. Um, and so just bringing that into their awareness too can also um, be really helpful. Um, and again, I forgot to mention, I am including like all of these questions that I'm gonna run through in a PDF. And I think in the previous video, I had said that it was a word and I apologize. It's actually a pages but it's an editable version. So if you want to bring these questions into your appointments and add your own, or if you want to, you know, delete out the questions that aren't helpful for you and keep those that are, um, you can do that. These are free resources to you. And um, hopefully they'll just help you get to where you need to be um, in your health journey. So those are the kind of, you know, more personal things that I wanted to address before asking these questions, just because I think that they can be barriers themselves to asking the questions themselves. So if you're having anxiety about asking a specific question, you know, my challenge for you is to ask what will happen if I don't ask this question during this appointment? Um, am I going to walk out of the appointment feeling anxious, like I didn't have my needs met? Am I going to start to have trust issues with myself or with the provider because I'm not having those needs met? Um, am I going to lose trust with myself because I'm not being honest about what I need and about what I'm thinking? Um, not that we're meaning to be dishonest. I think a lot of the times I think we're just trying to survive and make it through appointments, you know, but, um, you know, I've, I've read that that we often think that trust um, is established when another person fulfills a need that we have, but trust actually begins when we recognize and voice our own need. And so this is, um, these are our launching points for you to begin that trust cycle and to really, um, to get what you need and to restore trust in yourself and in your relationship relationships with your providers. And so again, I'm not a therapist. This is just based on my own experience, based on, you know, the information that I have pulled from mental health resources, um, and from relationship advice, um, that's been helpful for me. So, um, 
those are the more, you know, personal self evaluations that I like to, to bear in mind when I'm going into an appointment. The other piece that I like to keep in mind is what the doctor might be facing that day. Um, you know, COVID has done a number on all of us, and I think healthcare professionals especially have been um, have been tried by it. Like a lot of health healthcare professionals are experiencing burnout. Um, you know, on top of that, they have certain limitations because of insurance companies. They can only um, they're paid very little for you know the time that they spend with patients, and so. You know, they find that they're having to have several appointments in a short amount of time just to, you know, make their living. And then, you know, they also, they they have their own lives. You know, they have um, family, friends that they care about. And so I think it's important to keep these things in mind. Um, we all have we're all in different places in our communication and we're all in different places in our emotional growth and in our mental growth. And I think that, um, like for, for me in my case, when I've been trying to find helpful providers, I know that what I need is usually somebody that's middle-aged, um, usually a woman and that is willing to do research or that has experience with um, more rare conditions. And the reason for that is that I've found that those doctors have the experience. Um, they have an awareness that there are rare diseases out there. And so they're not going to, a lot, a lot of the time, not all, they're not going to assume that they know what the condition is. And I think when I've had younger providers, and this is nothing against, you know, if you're a, a recent graduate or anything like that, it's just my, been my experience that um, the younger folks might miss something um, that's more rare just because they haven't, you know, had that experience with any other patients. And then, you know, rare conditions, um, they call them rare because we don't see them so often, right? And so a lot of them might be underdiagnosed or underrecognized. Um, they might be mistaken for other conditions. And so there's, it's, it's a very complex thing, you know, going into these appointments, but I have found that my middle-aged ladies who are, who've had some experience under their belt and who are willing to ask questions and willing to do research, those have been um, the lifesavers for me. And um, there have been some, I've had some great male um, providers as well that are more willing to ask questions than to find answers and um, those that are willing to provide referrals. So those have been the types of providers that I have found worked for me. I think that's going to vary based on um, your own experience and your own background and your own situation. Um, and I think it could be helpful to be aware of that going into an appointment is that if this provider doesn't work out, maybe I need something that's not being met by this provider. And how can I, um, how can I find that maybe in a different type of provider? So I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself. That's in, a, in one of the questions that I'll ask here. Um, another thing to keep in mind going into appointments that I found to be helpful is if I have a specific goal or objective in mind. So when I was on the beginning of my diagnostic journey, it was, I'm having a slew of neurological symptoms. Um, I don't know why I need your help to figure this out because it's, it's hindering my day-to-day -day life. And um, that was where I started, right? And so as you get further along in your diagnosis process, it might become more specific. And the way that I have found helpful to communicate to doctors is to kind of have like a three-part statement from the get-go at the beginning of the appointment to let the doctor know where you are. Um, and that is like providing a general statement that provides like a broader kind of context. 
and then providing a specific question and then providing um, a, a specific goal that you have in mind. Um, I'm not sure if I said that right. Number two is supposed to be a, I'm sorry, you guys, hold on, let me look at my notes so that I say this right. Okay, so one is a big picture view, two is a statement of your primary concern, there we go, primary concern, and then three is the goal for your appointment. So I'll say that again, just for clarity. One is a big picture view of your symptoms to provide the larger context. Two is a statement of your primary concern, that, that primary symptom or group of symptoms that you're concerned about. And three is the goal for an appointment. So if I'm further along in my um, medical journey diagnosis odyssey, um, I might say something like, big picture, I've been to a lot of doctors. I've been having a lot of neurological symptoms over the past five years. I've been experiencing muscle weakness that I don't know what it's coming from. I seem to have specific triggers and I do my best to avoid those triggers, but I'm concerned about the potential cause and I would like to explore potential causes. So I'm looking for the next steps in that process. So you see that was big picture, specific, and then goal. Um, and a lot of times I've seen now, even where um, providers will, you know, like on the sheet that you jot down your symptoms and your medical history before you go into the appointment, um, they'll ask now, like, what is your goal for this appointment? And I think that is super helpful. So hats off to the providers that are doing that. Um, and then, um, that is what I found to be helpful going into appointment is to be goal-minded, to be as clear as possible, to be as direct as possible. And um, know that you're allowed to feel everything that you feel during an appointment. Um, that doesn't say like lash out or be disrespectful in any way if you get angry during appointment. We don't abuse people, that's not, that's not okay. Um, but to me, I can tend to push against my feelings um, in order to make it through an appointment. Um, but I have found that if I dive in deeper to those feelings and to explore the gut reactions that I'm having, and if I can do that in real time, whew, that is really powerful for, um, for the communications that can happen between me and the provider. And so um, you're allowed to feel everything that you feel in those appointments. You can feel happy, you can feel sad, you can feel really confused, it's, it's all allowed. Um, and then last thing before going into appointment, um, know that you can move on to a different provider if you need to. Nobody is, is going to make you go to this provider, um, especially if there's any kind of abuse that happens, don't go back to that provider. Find somebody that will listen to you and they will get you to the care that you need. That is why they're there. <laughs> and so um, just have those things in mind going into an appointment. And so I'm finally getting to the actual questions here. And I apologize, I kind of went a little roundabout and got ahead of myself in places, but hopefully this handout will kind of help you. So questions to ask during an appointment. Um, I find that starting out with a simple, hi, how are you to the provider can be really helpful. And it sounds like a simple, like obvious thing, but I think it helps establish the relationship with the provider as not a like, I've got a medical degree and you're gonna do what I say and I'm just a patient and I know nothing like down here 
and uh, these are terrible stereotypes, but bear with me. Um, but I think that just asking a, hey, how are you? And hey, how are you? Like, this is a partnership now. Like, we are connecting as human beings. Yes, one person might have more medical knowledge. The other person has all these weird experiences, but we're communicating and we're on the same ground. And um, I think that's really important to establish that patient provider relationships are meant to be a partnership. Um, and it can really hinder things like if you're feeling spoken down to or um, on the other hand, like if you're, you know, thinking that you know something that the doctor doesn't um, and not communicating that, then that can be really detrimental to the relationship too. So um, just starting out with a how are you, um, establishing that rapport can go a long way. And you might even learn, like I've had doctors where they're just honest and they're like during the pandemic, like I don't even know how they do what they do. Um, thank you if you're a healthcare provider and you're watching this, thank you for doing what you do. Like I, I don't know how you do it. And I, it's, um, it's really remarkable. Um, you guys are amazing. And um, if you have any suggestions um, based on the discussion in this video, please comment. I want this to not only be a discussion for patients, um, amongst patients, I want it to be an open discussion with providers as well. Like what has helped you in these patient provider relationships? And um, yeah, so establishing a rapport, asking how are you? That's my first question. Um, when the doctor asks what brings you in today, that's when I would suggest considering that three-part response of the big picture, um, the specific symptoms that you really wanna address during that appointment, and then your goal for the appointment. Um, and I think I might be tilting a little. I have this on a like not so stable. I'm propping up this phone with a Gilmore Girls uh, box set. <laughs> so shout out to the Gilmore Girls fans out there. Um, but it might start to like dip down. So I apologize. Um, let's see. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Um, and this is where having that self-awareness comes in. I am an introverted intuitive type. If you follow Meyer Briggs, um, I type as an INFJ, and so this is what has really helped me. It might not be as helpful for other types, um, but I'm hoping that it will still be relatable. So, um, by the way, like, I have found that Myers-Briggs can be extremely helpful in helping me understand my, my blind spots and helping me to improve communications, um, and this is not a... Um, paid plug for the for Myers Briggs in any way. It's just a. Um, I have found that to be the most um, helpful personality typing quiz if you're into them, um, and it's really helped me in in this. Maybe I'll do a video on that. I don't know. We'll see. But anyways, um, the question I have found helpful to ask myself during. A, an appointment is if I'm having a strong emotional reaction um, what am I feeling in that moment am I feeling misunderstood am I feeling frustrated am I having a strong agreement um, am I having red flags going off because I'm remembering information um, that I have learned through research and that information is contradicting the information that I am being presented. And um, I think asking that question of what am I feeling and then digging in deeper to why am I feeling that way really helps to drill down to the information that you need to communicate to the provider. So, um, 
saying something like, hey, I'm feeling really conflicted about this information um, and going from there. I think another great question to ask the provider is, can you help me understand the diagnostic criteria and how I do or I don't meet the diagnostic criteria? So this is like if a, in a situation where a provider is either giving a diagnosis or ruling out a diagnosis. And, um, or maybe you're just both considering um, whether you might have a specific condition. So really getting to the specifics of why they think, um, why they think a particular condition might be what you're experiencing can be really helpful um, just to understand their rationale. And then, um, Another question to ask the provider, a lot of times there can be lingo that we as patients don't understand. And I think in those moments, it's really helpful um, to say, hey, you're, you mentioned this word. I don't really know what that means. Can you help me understand that? Or um, they might be even using common words, but in a different way than they're used in common language. So, um, for example, I was in an appointment once where, um, you know, I was having difficulty breathing and um, it wasn't super significant, but I could tell and I was communicating that to the provider and they said that the, the symptom was subjective. Well, I had an immediate emotional reaction to that internally of like, well, I'm not making this up. Like, how can it be subjective, you know? But... Um, I later learned that when doctors use the word subjective, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't believe you. It's that um, the, the symptom is being expressed and the doctor cannot see it, but the patient is experiencing it. So that's how my new understanding came about. Um, so that can be really helpful. Um, this other question to ask providers goes along with the, the previous question. Can you help me understand the rationale behind your diagnosis? And I think this can be a little more finely nuanced than the previous question of can you help me understand the diagnostic criteria and how I meet or don't meet them? And the reason that I think that is this, um, diagnostic criteria kind of evolve over time, right? As like scientists and researchers learn more about the condition, something that was considered an anomaly or um, anecdotal might even become a part of the diagnostic criteria over time. Um, so I think that that question, can you help me understand the rationale behind your diagnosis? Um, will help to acknowledge that um, the doctor might be coming to a conclusion about what they think based on that anecdotal information that they might have in mind. So um, that can be a helpful question to kind of draw out that information. Um, And this can be a, this goes, this question gets into kind of just the, how to format a question, how to word things in a way that um, will help the provider and help you, um, is to ask yourself, if I disagree with a provider, what information do I have that's causing me to disagree? Um, and then you might consider a response at like, so this is what I'm hearing from you, but I've seen this stated like in the literature um, and maybe you have a specific uh, reference or you have a specific um, body of information that you're referencing. That can be really helpful for providers. Um, so you say, but I've seen this stated in the literature for the condition, which seems to contradict the information that I'm being presented with. Can you help me understand? Um, so that's a question that you might ask if you're having that conflict of, um, well, the doctor's saying this, but my symptoms are seeming this way, and this is the information that I've read. That's a way for you to, to um, explore that idea with the doctor. 
Um, another question to ask that I have found helpful because I, I notoriously forget things in appointments, but, um, if I'm having a conflict, um, about what a doctor is saying, is it because I forgot to mention something, you know, if that doctor doesn't have that vital piece of information, they might be looking in a completely different direction, right? So um, did I fail to communicate something that was important? And then that's just an opportunity for me in that appointment to say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I had a brain fart moment and I forgot to mention this, all right? Um, and you might get into that cycle of like, oh, they're gonna think I'm making this up, but just remember to challenge that if I don't bring this up, what will happen? You know, like I can get into a misdiagnosis. I won't get the care that I need. Just remember that, okay? So um, another question, another way of like rephrasing it um, might be like if you, what's fantastic is we have all of these specialists that prevent present in webinars and all of this information available to us now, right? The challenge is that we can get you know, tunnel vision or um, not be aware of other conditions that could be similar to one another, right? So it can be really hard when we're trying, when doctors are trying to make that differential diagnosis. Um, so you might phrase something like, I've actually heard this from a specialist in this area. Can I show you this YouTube video where that information was presented? Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of like a general neurologist might not know what a, um, gosh, I don't know the technical phrases, what a more specialized neurologist might know, not might know, right? So like presenting that specialized knowledge might, um, bring on further discussion in that appointment. Um, you can also bring in, like, if you are a part of support groups or if you have found resources on a professional association's website. So, like, for example, I'm pursuing a periodic paralysis diagnosis right now to see if that might be explaining my muscle weakness. Um, a resource that has been really helpful for me is the Periodic Paralysis Association. And so, um, the researchers and doctors in that area will actually provide a list or they will discuss um, common misdiagnoses and um, you know why they're misdiagnosed similarities and symptoms and so that can be really helpful and if you have that information that outside reference point to say um, you know my symptoms seem to be consistent with this information um, that this specialist is saying, not just me, but this specialist, then can we consider that? Can we go in this direction? Um, that's really helpful for doctors because they know that you're not just bringing this up out of nowhere, you know, like, so um, that I have found to be helpful. Um, and that, that goes into the next question. Um, what information can I share with the doctor to help him or her understand the contradictory information I have? Is there a website available to help the healthcare professional? Um, they might not be aware of certain conditions. They might have not been taught certain things in medical school. They might have misinformation. You know, I've encountered that a lot with, um, exploring the idea of periodic paralysis. A lot of doctors um, like in emergency rooms aren't aware, they might be aware of like the acute conditions of hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, but they might not be aware of um, the nuances of the chronic conditions of periodic paralysis. And so even in that communication, they might not understand that those are two different things. So, um, that can be a challenge and that's um, a way to um, approach that situation. Um, if you receive a diagnosis or um, if a doctor thinks that you have a certain condition, these are some great questions to ask. Um, what is the prognosis like for someone with this condition, right? So you kind of want to have like certain expectations in mind am I going to be able to continue exercising or 
Um, are there certain lifestyle changes that I need to make um, because of the prognosis of this condition? Uh, what are my treatment or management options? Um, just getting clarity about those options can be really helpful. What are the risks of treatment? Are there any supplements that I could take that help me benefit? For example, I take magnesium to help with my migraines and constipation. So um, are there any medications that I should not be taking with this condition? Some conditions um, like uh, long QT syndrome, for example, there are is a long list of medications that you do not want to take if you experience long QT. Um, are there any lifestyle tips that could help me manage or improve the in condition? So some things are very manageable. Maybe you need to go see a physical therapist or um, maybe a, a psychological therapist can help just with the the mental you know maybe mental trauma for going through the healthcare system for one but also um, in helping to communicate your symptoms and your condition to other people and ever overcoming those kind of communication barriers um, Asking the provider, are you able to recommend any support groups, any literature, websites, or organizations where I can find additional support, right? Because like our doctors only have limited time with us. And so it's really up to us to advocate for ourselves and to find the resources that we need. Um, and support groups, uh, Facebook support groups, I know I, I mention that a lot, but I'm such a fan of Facebook support groups because they've helped me so much. Um, YouTube channels, YouTubers have helped me immensely in navigating the healthcare system and um, finding that support you need. So asking that question, if they know of any um, providers or any uh, associations that are good resources. For example, um, when I was diagnosed with functional neurological disorder, I was given two different websites as a support. And uh, one of those is run by John Stone, who's a a specialist in the area of FND. And so um, I found some of those videos to be really, really helpful on YouTube and his information to be helpful. Um, that'll also help you kind of discern between what's good information and what's bad information. Um, information that's backed up by scientific research and information that um, maybe it's people speaking from their own experience, but I think it's also good to acknowledge that, you know, people can have more condition and more than one condition and not be aware of it. <laughs> and so avoiding that trap of, um, you know, taking one, pers exper one person's experience as, as Bible, basically, in, in healthcare sense. Um, and that's why I always put the caveat, I'm not a doctor. So take all this with a grain of salt. <laughs> um, <clears throat> asking the question, can this condition be passed on to my kids genetically? So if you already have kids, what is their risk? Um, or if you're planning to have kids, this was a big question for me, like what is the, um, what's the likelihood of this condition being passed on? Is there a 50% chance that they will also have this condition um, and it can also help you understand like if they start to develop symptoms then that might be this excuse me that might be the source of of their symptoms is the condition that you have so um, that can be helpful is this condition contagious there are a lot of conditions that are contagious. There are a lot of conditions that are not. I think in most cases, if it's contagious, the doctor is going to let you know. Um, but for clarity, sometimes it's just good to ask. Um, asking the provider what kind of testing could help us move towards a diagnosis or management is a great question to ask. Um, and sometimes if you, 
especially you're looking into rare diseases, the doctor might not be aware of those tests. And in my experience, it might be best at that point to seek out a specialist that does have an understanding of that because even then there can be certain situations with the testing that are complicated. But um, that can be a great question to ask. If it's not something that's super rare and they are knowledgeable about, then that kind of gives you um, an idea of what to expect or whether even that testing is needed. Um, so this is a tip that I picked up from a podcaster who speaks to chronic illness. And so I just love like, well, don't love it's actually, it's an uncomfortable thing for me, but it's in a good way. Um, and I think it might be for other people as well, but um, and the fact that it's confrontational. And I think this is one of those areas where you might need to be confrontational if you are um, feeling very certain that you have a condition, um, your symptoms align with it. Maybe your family history even aligns with it, but the doctor is just not convinced and you're requesting a specific medical test because you know that that medical testing can help you rule out or rule in that condition. Um, if the doctor denies doing that testing, this is the tip that was recommended was tell the provider or ask the provider, if you are not going to recommend that testing for me, can you please include that in the medical record for me that you are refusing that medical test because that will cause them to think again about whether or not you truly need the testing. Um, so that can be helpful. Um, asking if you do, if you are going to proceed with some kind of testing, what are the limitations of the test, right? So no medical test is 100% perfect. Even blood work can be influenced by temperature changes, by the way blood is drawn. Um, MRIs have their limitations, CAT scans have their limitations. Um, so what are those limitations? What can you expect um, out of that? And um, asking the question, will this test rule out blank condition or disease? So if you are concerned about a specific disease or condition, asking that question, will this test specifically rule this out? Because a lot of times, tests, for example, genetic testing, can't completely rule out a condition. Um, it can diagnose, maybe, if you have a condition, which can be really, really helpful, but it, not, it can't necessarily disclude that diagnosis, and that can be really frustrating to be in that middle place, but it's good to know because, um, you know, there's other, there's conditions out there that we just we haven't discovered everything yet that's to be discovered in science and in genetics. And um, doctors are aware of that usually, hopefully. Um, and so asking that question can help set your own expectations um, about whether you can have certainty to a certain degree or not. Um, asking the provider, are there any risks associated with surgery, anesthesia, or other medical procedures for those that have this condition? So if you've been diagnosed with a specific condition, um, having answers to those specific things could be helpful. So for example, with Ehlers-Danlos, um, with more severe forms of Ehlers-Danlos, you need to be aware of um, and the, the name is like escaping me. It's like something hyperthermia, malignant hyperthermia. There we go. Um, I think this is an Ehlers-Danlos. Gosh, I'm questioning that. But anyways, um, if I'm under, if I'm remembering that correctly, certain severe forms of um, Ehlers-Danlos. Maybe this is periodic paralysis. I might be getting the two confused, and I apologize if I am. Definitely don't quote me on this. There is a condition that makes people more susceptible to malignant hyperthermia during anesthesia. And um, so there are specific precautions that need to be taken, like if a patient with that condition is undergoing surgery of any kind. 
um, certain conditions like mast cell activation syndrome might make you anaphylactic to certain things, which is very scary, a life-threatening situation, like an allergic reaction to something that can cut off your breathing and all that kind of good stuff. So it's good to be aware of those kind of things. Um, another great question to ask the provider, especially if you are seeking out confirmation or to rule out a rare disease is, do you see other patients with this condition? Um, doctors can only know what they know, right? So if they don't have experience with a particular group of patients, they're not going to know the nuances of that condition. And um, they might not interpret your symptoms the same way that you're interpreting them. And so it that's where I found it's really helpful to seek out a specialist that really knows. If I, if I have a particular concern about a specific um, condition and it's lesser known, then I have found it to be more helpful to seek somebody that sees those patients regularly or at least regularly enough, like maybe they've specialized in that area um, in their research, then that can be really helpful. And it can be helpful to understand that where like if you're in a, a an appointment where the doctor is ruling out a rare condition, but they're not aware of the nuances in the condition um, to not only get their rationale for excluding a diagnosis, but to also understand that they have a limited perspective on that specific condition. So it can be good as a patient just to be aware so that you know, um, okay, maybe I'm gonna need to seek out a specialist or another doctor or um, you know that kind of thing. Maybe I'll need to do more research. Maybe I need to provide this provider with more information. Um, so um, another question that I like to ask, and I have asked many times, do you recommend following up with a specialist? And if so, can you provide a referral? I have asked for so many referrals and most doctors in my experience are more than willing to provide a referral. And um, that will um, that will help you get to where you need to be um, and to rule out specific conditions or to explore them further. Um, another question that I have asked that has been helpful um, is I see my lab results or x-ray notes or medical test notes, etc, whatever it is. And this is especially I think relevant today where we have, patient portals and you can see your test results crazy fast. And for me, like, I'm like, whoa, well, this is out of range. What does this mean? What does this mean? I, I get really curious. And um, if I find that if I don't ask that question and I'm seeing those results, I question whether we need to be addressing that, <laughs> you know, if the doctor has seen it, I don't know. And so um, pointing that out, I see that this is out of range. This doesn't seem normal to me. Should I be concerned? Um, and they will provide you their opinion. And that can help you also judge whether you agree or disagree and what steps you want to take next. Uh, da -da 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 -da. If you find that you are disagreeing and you're getting frustrated in a an appointment and this has happened to me and honestly like for me I just haven't had like the the wherewithal in that moment or like I've been like I've had some great appointments that lasted a long time and though they might have been helpful like I get hungry and my mental presence is not there I have a very my body does not handle getting hungry well and so Sometimes my body's way of dealing with that is I just get super weepy. Um, or sometimes I'm just frustrated and I cry because I get frustrated because I'm having red flags going off in my mind, but I can't fully unpack that in the moment. And so I have learned that if I'm in that situation, I give my space, I give myself the space to, you know, have that emotional moment if I need to and um, to bring up, if I can, the red flags that I'm having. Like, this is the information that 
that's conflicting this this point this point and kind of lay it out for the provider and that also helps me in cases where you know if i'm dealing with a rare condition and they aren't aware of the nuances of that then that becomes clear in that moment and that's when i I might have the understanding of, okay, I might need to see another pr- uh, provider. And that can be really frustrating because it's it can be exhausting going from specialist to specialist to specialist. But for me, I have found that it's more helpful to ask those questions and to confront those questions in, in the appointment than to have to go in circles and uh, maybe follow up with them in different ways, like through the portal or another appointment, which are not bad. It's just more time consuming, can be more exhausting. And you're dealing with symptoms on top of that and the rest of your life it's um it's just helpful to bring them up in so um something i have encountered um is i will bring up um like a rare condition periodic paralysis for example in my situation um when I was looking at looking into CSF leaks, um, which are a, a risk if you have Ehlers-Danlos, be advised. Um, and I didn't know that I had Ehlers-Danlos at the time. Um, if you um, find that a doctor is saying they're they're using the logic of this is rare, so therefore you cannot have it, challenge that. Um, in some ways that I would suggest challenging it is, is it possible that the condition is rare because it's under-recognized and under-diagnosed? And um, another way is rare doesn't mean that it doesn't exist at all. And if I do have this condition, it's going to affect my life. It's already affecting my life and I need a way to manage these symptoms. Um, Another way to challenge the whole it's rare, so therefore you cannot have it, um, is if my symptoms and family history align, is that reason enough to pursue the diagnosis or to rule it out? And um, the last suggestion I have is if you've been through a lot of testing, a lot of diagnoses, and the specific condition that you are questioning um, whether you might have it has not been addressed or tested for is to ask, could it be taking me so long to get a diagnosis because my condition is rare? Um, so those are just questions to challenge the logic. Um, and another great, great question that I have learned to ask is, excuse me, what if if the provider is giving you a specific diagnosis or um, is saying that you don't have a diagnosis, but he thinks or she thinks you might have this, um, a question that you can ask is, what is making you choose this diagnosis over this diagnosis? And fill in the blank for this diagnosis versus this diagnosis, whatever they're saying versus what you have in your mind. And that will help clarify um, the information that the doctor has and the information that they might not have and the information that you might not have, right? Because like, as patients, we don't always have the information. A lot of times we don't have all the information. And so that can be really helpful to understand and to be able to go from that point. So those are my list of questions to ask during an appointment. Um, You might have other questions in mind or you might have experienced um, other situations where a question brought a breakthrough in your appointment. If so, please put those in the comments. Um, Help us other patients out. And um, if any of this was helpful to you, please let me know. Um, I did wanna go over some questions to ask at the end of the appointment um, that can help you determine your next steps, right? So if you don't get a clear-cut diagnosis and the doctor isn't providing a clear direction, you can ask yourself, um, have I met the goal for for my appointment that I set out to achieve? 
or did I at least get the next step? Um, and if you haven't accomplished your goal, maybe restating that to the doctor to kind of, you know, re-navigate back to that and to have it addressed. Um, asking yourself, how do I feel about this doctor? Am I feeling anxious about around this doctor because I'm not feeling heard? Um, is the doctor asking really specific questions about my symptoms? Do I feel like they might be overgeneralizing my symptoms? Um, how do how do I feel? How do I feel like the communications are? How do I feel emotionally around this person? Um, do I have any lingering questions? And that's a great time to ask those lingering questions or to say, hey, I have some other questions or I know I'm going to have additional questions. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Should I follow up with you in the patient portal or can I make another appointment? What works best? Um, Another great question to ask is, has there been new information provided that I need to digest? So maybe I was thinking one diagnosis, this has happened to me several times, right? I'm, uh, especially with blood clots, for example, um, I thought I had polycythemia vera and, um, you know, we ruled out the JAK2 mutation. So um, I had received new information during that appointment and you know, I needed time to digest that. And so um, that's another great time to just kind of take a step back. Do I need to digest new information? Am I having a new info? Am I having an emotional reaction just because I'm overwhelmed by all this new information and I don't have time to make a decision or I feel overwhelmed by the idea of making a next step? Um, and just saying to your doctor, hey, like, this is new information to me. I really want to take this, um, take this to heart to to kind of think about it, and I want to come back and decide after I've had time to think about this, um, and that's perfectly valid. And um, doctors usually, in my in my experience, will honor that. Um, you are not, you are in the driver's seat, right? You are the one responsible for navigating and discerning what you think will be best for your situation. So if you need that time in your in space to digest, give yourself some grace and um, that can be really helpful for you in your process. Um, another great question to ask um, towards the end of the appointment, I'm sorry, these are not always gonna be after, I think I misspoke before. These are not all after, but these are towards the end of an appointment. Sorry about that. Um, but you can ask the provider, what's my next step? Um, if the provider doesn't know what the next step is, ask whether um, they might need time to consider the next step or maybe if a referral to a specialist might be appropriate. Um, Just an FYI, some insurance does require a referral to see a specialist, some do not. Um, so check with your um, insurance company and check with the network that you're working with, the hospital network that you're working with to see if they require referrals or even ask the provider there, like, do you guys require referrals for specialists? Um, sometimes that happens even if you have a PPO. I don't understand it. I don't like it but that's just the way it is. So it's better to ask than to not in those situations. Um, this is a biggie during an appointment. Um, and this kind of, hopefully this goes without saying, but I just want to reiterate it. Uh, asking great questions and kind of getting to the, to the crux of things does not, mean allowing yourself to be abused in a in an appointment if you are experiencing any kind of an abuse during an appointment whether it's mental emotional or physical walk out that's absolutely where i feel like you have the right and the that's self-care like that is protecting yourself um 
and you can do that. You can walk out of the appointment. And I would suggest um, finding someone nearby um, or talking to the hospital administration and filing a complaint um, if you experience abuse of any kind. Um, other less extreme, like that's the time when you definitely don't want to go back to that doctor, right? Um, I think there are other times when you might want to consider, consider, <laughs> I like that, that'd be a new word, consider, um, consider switching providers um, if they don't seem to have the specialized knowledge that you need to have peace of mind that you don't have a specific condition, I would suggest seeking a specialist. If they seem to be overgeneralizing or oversimplifying your symptoms, like that might be a particular way that that, that you find out that they don't have that special knowledge. Um, so like if they're saying things like, oh, everyone experiences blank symptom every once in a while or anxiety can cause a lot of weird symptoms do you think you might be anxious or um, your medical medical records show you have this diagnosis so i think all of your symptoms are really that diagnosis if they're kind of lumping everything together um it might be time for you to see either a different doctor that can refer you to a specialist or to see a specialist um if you find that over time you are going in circles with doctors, you're an emotional wreck and you're exhausted all the time from going to appointments, that can happen regardless. But I think especially um, it can be a sign that you need a specialist that understands a condition that most doctors don't know about. Because if, if doctors are just bouncing you back and forth, it might be that they just don't have the knowledge base and they don't know what to do with you. Um, and that's happened to me before. So um, just take that as a sign that you might need a specialist. Um, in support groups, they can be a great way to find specialists. These professional associations that um, know about conditions like mitochondrial disease, periodic paralysis, um, Ehlers-Danlos, a lot of times they'll have a find their provider um, like web page or resource where you can call them and ask or you can ask in these support groups hey is there anybody in the u.s or hey is there anyone in my area in my country that knows of a provider in this specific area and there are facebook groups out there that are very specific like i have found two support groups for periodic paralysis that have been absolutely phenomenal and i don't know where i'd be without them um so those might be helpful resources for you. Um, something I just want to mention um, about the feeling like an emotional wreck and feeling exhausted, I would say that there is a difference between feeling disappointed in yourself, like if you forget to bring something up um, or you feel like you didn't communicate something well, um, that's a very different feeling from feeling like you're not feeling heard, um, feeling like the doctor is not understanding you, feeling like you're on a completely different planet from the doctor. Those are very different feelings. And you can experience both of those during an appointment, but I think it can be helpful to kind of sift through um, what you're feeling to help you understand if, okay, it's not me, um, I need to move on to a specialist. Um, whereas like if you understand that, oh, I made an oops, like I forgot to mention this, you can just go back to the provider. Usually they're very understanding of that kind of thing and just be like, I forgot to bring this up during the appointment and it's like super important. And I, what, can, how can I talk to you about this? Can I reach out to you in a portal? Can I make another appointment? How can I, how can I discuss this with you kind of thing? Um, Another red flag to me that you might need to switch providers is if the provider discourages you from doing your own research. If you have been looking for an answer to your symptoms for a long time and they're saying don't do your research, um, it might mean that they don't feel confident that they can defend their stance. It can, I, th I think it can mean a lot of things. I think a lot of the times doctors like nowadays are really concerned about misinformation, which is completely understandable because we have information moving so fast in so many different directions and it can, misinformation can take a toll very quickly, right? So that can be completely 
different. I think for me, the approach that I have learned is more helpful is if I present information that I have learned from others to the physician and ask, do you think this is misinformation or do you think this is inaccurate? Um, And letting them, you know, confront that in that moment to, to kind of determine that. Um, but I have found that if somebody is discouraging me from doing my own research, that's going to hold up things. And if there's not, if I'm not constantly learning, then how can I accurately figure out what I'm experiencing? Right. And, um, another red flag is if the provider becomes very defensive when you're asking questions, um, they might be experiencing frustration because they have a limited time with you. Um, if that's the situation, you might want to say, hey, like I have a lot of questions. Can we break this up into maybe several appointments or maybe telehealth a- appointments? Um, or can you send me to somebody that might be able to help me with my questions? Um, support groups are also really great for that. Not that everyone necessarily has um, the same, same, they weren't necessarily diagnosed with the same level of confidence. So you want to be aware of that going into support groups. Some people may have been dis- misdiagnosed. Um, some people might be clinically diagnosed and have potentially a genetic condition, but they don't have the genetic um, basis for that yet. Um, and some people might be genetically diagnosed. Those are golden. Um, and so, yeah, just... Um, being aware that if a provider becomes defensive when you're asking questions, there might be multiple reasons for that, but it's not going to be helpful for you if you can't get to where you need to go. Um, So you might want to consider switching providers. Um, And if you've tried working with a provider and the treatment just isn't helping, that might be time to move on to a different provider. Um, They might just not have the experience or the skill set that you need, and that's okay. Like, we all have our limitations. We all have a specific knowledge base. And um, if it's not working for you, it might be time to move on. Um, This is something I learned about recently and that I actually did recently was filing an appeal to my medical records. And that was because I was seeing after appointments that there was inaccurate information in my medical records. And if you are finding that there's inaccurate information in your medical records, know that you can file an appeal. And this is true in the US and in Canada. I'm not sure of other countries, but um, I'm hoping that they have other ways for you to do that. Maybe talk to the hospital administration to see what their process is for filing um, changes to your medical records. Um, But if there is incorrect information. So for example, um, and this is a thing in neurology, like knowing whether you're left-handed or right-handed matters to some neurologists um, because it has certain implications for different conditions. But um, I was put down as right-handed. I don't remember being asked whether I was right-handed or left-handed. I certainly didn't say that I was right-handed, but there in my medical records, it said that I was right-handed. I'm a lefty. Um, I've had my name misspelled. I've um, even gone so far as to ask for the functional neurological disorder diagnosis to be removed as um, I think that my symptoms are more aligned with um, the triggers, the family medical history, the physical traits presented by Anderson to Will syndrome. So, um, you know, I'm still, I still debate over that in my mind. But um, I did put in that appeal because I think that there was um, testing that was not performed in the way that it needed to be in order for me to accurately rule out periodic paralysis. The infirm- like the basis of the diagnosis didn't, um, in my mind, seem to add up to what was needed to, um, to diagnose functional neurological disorder. Um, So if you're in that kind of situation, just know that you can make an appeal, um, go to the hospital website, call the doctor's office, find out what their formal process is for 
for making a change to your medical records, they have to, by law, respond within 60 days. So um, that is a thing. <laughs> um, so if you need to do that, do that. I think that is all that I've got for today. I know that's a lot of information. Again, um, I have a pages editable document and a PDF document that you can use at your discretion um, that I will post in the um, description below. If you have any comments, was this helpful for you? Was it not helpful? Um, are there specific questions that stuck out to you, that spoke to you? Um, do you have other questions that you have asked during appointments that you have found to be really helpful? Um, post those in the comments below and I would be really interested to hear about that. Thanks for listening. This has been a long one and I will see y'all in the next video. Bye.